This is Abe Freetanzer from The Film Experience, and I'm thrilled to be able to speak with Fran Krantz about his directorial debut, Mass. How are you doing today, Fran? I'm good. I'm good. I'm okay. Thank you, Abe. I, pre I really appreciate it. The movie means a lot to me, so I, I really appreciate you talking. Of course. Of course. I saw the film about a year ago at last year's Sundance Film Festival. So it's really nice, especially being right in the middle of Sundance right now, again, to be able to revisit this film as it's, you know, still part of the conversation. I know, like I, it's funny. It's like I haven't really moved on. I'm almost grateful that it's totally virtual because I'm sort of treating the, this week like I'm back there and I'm, my laptop's always playing a movie and it's sort of, it's bringing me back. It's kind of nice, <laughs> bringing back nice memories. Yeah. Well, that's really great. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, but I want to ask first, before we start to dive deep, how much do you want people to know about this film before they see it? The plot summaries are often pretty vague from what I've read. Yeah, I, apologies, that's me. I, I want, I, 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 yeah, ideally, you know, you don't know anything. Um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's it's written it, look the the major effort of the writing is to sort of be completely as truthful as i could possibly be to sort of the dynamics of the situation that the characters would only say what they really what we believe they would they would need to say or want to say that we're not giving out information or exposition for the sake of the audience you know we're we're going to we have to sort of learn everything as we go through these characters that experienced it so they're not going to share things that they already know right or talk about things they already know so in a in a perfect world you know nothing i i realize now you know it, it, so many reviews are synopsis right so <laughs> not synopses i mean I, that seems to be part of uh you know the film review sort of process these days so the movie is out there and I also believe, I, I, you know, that it it doesn't it doesn't matter, you know, if if you know that there still can be a real powerful effect and feeling, and you can be moved by this movie no matter what, you know, because I I think if you know what the meeting is, it, so much of what the movie is is about well, well, why would you have a meeting like that? Why would you go to a meeting like that? Why would you want to? Or no one would want to, but why? You know, the why and the mechanics of how a meeting like that would work. I, you know, that's what's compelling, I think, about the movie. Um, it's certainly why I wanted to write it is because as soon as I learned about these meetings that they actually happened, I thought, oh, how, on, how on earth can you do that? You know, what does that look like? I wanted to know. So, so I think it's okay to sort of get the sort of idea of why they're there um, because it's sort of the how and what happens that I think is the most, you know, sort of um, that, that's the real, where the real emotion is. Of course, and and how and when did you first learn about these meetings? So, so I was totally overwhelmed by the Parkland shooting in a way that I never, I, I, I can't, I can't really remember so few experiences in my life with sort of newsworthy events or tragedies around the world affected me quite like this. Um, and I think it was because I was a new parent. I had a kid. She was just over, she was around one and a half years old. I was a vulnerable, freaked out parent feeling like, you know, <laughs> like I was this never going to figure this thing out. And um, th th so I, I just was completely sort of cut down by that, uh, that day and listening to parents and children. And I thought, I need to know about this. I, you know, I was 18 when Columbine happened. I want to know more about what's going on here. Um, and so that I immediately started doing, you know, reading books and not with a movie in mind, you know, right. I, I just felt like I needed to know. And there was a sort of obsession that kind of built out of it where every, that's all I re was reading. And I'd stay up late at night. I couldn't fall asleep reading because of the material and the, and how painful it was. Um, but sort of, there was something energizing about it too, that I, I felt like I was getting to some sort of truth that was necessary for me as a, as a parent and a person. And, um, and, and it was quick. I mean, so Parkland was February, 2018. My first drafts are late April. I think the first completed draft is in May, uh, or completed, so to speak, you know, just kind of a big old mess, but, um, I, I, it, it, so it was quick so that there, there was sort of a handful of Columbine parents and parents from Newtown, uh, and where I'd learn about these. And I had a, thankfully a relationship with one of the uh, journalists and authors, Dave Cullen, 
you know, I was able to sort of reach out to people and learn that, you know, these things happen more than we'd ever know about. And that it immediately made me think of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because it was something that always fascinated me when I was younger, but, but, but scared me because I didn't, you know, I, I imagined in my own life, you know, what would happen to me if I lost someone I loved in this kind of, in this way or to, you know, to violence. And I would, I would want retribution. I'd, I'd be so angry. I'd want punishment. I don't know if I'd ever get over it. You know, those, those sort of feelings and, um, you know, witnessing or reading and learning about how South Africa and, you know, under, you know, kind of the craftsmanship of Archbishop Desmond Tutu sort of created this commission where the purpose was to heal and possibly even grant amnesty to perpetrators if they showed real remorse. And it was this in incredible uh, concept to me. And so that's, that's what I thought what was happening here. I thought these people are just trying to move forward. They're trying to improve a painful situation, which is something we can all relate to. And I, so that was it. I wanted to dramatize it. So it, it all, I can't, I can't be certain exactly when, and I'm, this is a, such a long winded answer, but I mean, we're talking about three months over the course of three months, I, I found these meetings, multiple meetings like it and started to dramatize it. Cause there was, there was so few details, you know, they, they, there, there's no transcript to this. There are in the truth and reconciliation commission. So I, I started, I went back to sort of Desmond Tutu and his writings and going there for research to sort of see like, well, what do these really look like? And then a lot of it was just myself kind of improvising as a actor writer and playing these four parts, you know? Yeah, and you take a lot of effort, I think, to really set the stage with that opening scene with Frida Wool before we meet any of the other characters. Can you talk more about the intentionality of that? Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I really, I, I believe the movie doesn't work without that opening. I, I, I really believe it. And I, I'm always sort of afraid, because there's a part of me that doesn't really know why I did that, or I sort of understand it. Um, it was the first thing I ever wrote. I sat down to write this movie about a meeting of four parents in this situation. And yet the things that I started writing were these three other people, um, you know, setting up a room. And, uh, and I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you the perfect sort of explanation of it, but I, and, I, and forgive me if this sounds insensitive, but I, I really felt if it was just a forehander because people gave me that note, you know, especially started as a screenplay. And then for several months, I it was a play, a stage play. I felt like, well, maybe this is a play. And people thought, have you thought about this as a forehander? Like, I don't know what the hell this 15, what is this stuff at the beginning? And I really thought like, look, if we, you go to the movies and you show me four people in this situation and then that's it and it's over and that's all we got, then it's, it's, it's just terrible fiction. It's just, it's just this, a sad story of four damaged, tragic people. And I get to go home and wipe my hands of it and move on with my life. That I won't actually feel the empathy that I wanted the audience to feel for these characters if I just present them almost like zoo animals, almost like let's just put on display for really tragic people. And, 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 and that's it. I, I wanted to sort of trick the audience into the story or lead them into the story by way of real life, by way of ordinary people, so to speak, people that haven't experienced unimaginable tragedy, people that are kind of complaining about the daily stresses of their lives, like traffic and my son's soccer practice and my, you know, this and that, and, and, and keep it mundane, keep it very sort of simple and mundane and even let the audience feel almost superior to the characters they're watching. And then I, I don't really know what this movie's about. I don't know where this is going, but those two people seem pretty incapable of whatever's about to happen. And I'm laughing at them a little bit. And now I'm starting to get the sense, wait a minute, this is more serious, but ultimately you're completely blindsided by what the movie actually is. And so when you meet these four characters, you're sort of in the perfect kind of position or spot or sort of emotional place as an audience to be affected and connect with these people in a way that you might not have been able to had the movie just began with them, you know, packing the, you know, getting in the car and driving to the meeting. I, I, I really believe that. And I don't know if there's a way to quantify it <laughs> or, or prove it, you know, empirically or whatever, but I, I, I really, I really believe that. <laughs> and, the, and the three of them are incredible. Brita, Michelle, and Kagan are just, are, are pitch perfect in that opening. 
And the- I do I do think that it's important to establish a neutral space because otherwise, if you're in one of their homes or somewhere else where they have, you know, right. mementos of people and everything surrounding, it's there's something nice, I think, about the conversation happening in a place that's not familiar to, to any of them. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and then there was some sort of, maybe this is a little saccharine, but, you know, I felt like it's nice. This is about people helping people. You know, these meetings don't happen in a vacuum either. You know, there are, there are people that are sort of making that effort to, to, to get these people up and off their feet and help them and improve their lives. And I wanted, I wanted that to be a, a storyline. I wanted that to be a sort of a, a shade of, you know, to the whole film is that, you know, you know, we can, we can kind of do this as a community as in it, we, we can sort of make an effort to sort of, you know, help and heal. You know? Yeah. And you have such fantastic cast members in these this, these four, and I'm curious. I'd love to talk about each of them. And I'm I'm wondering specifically where you knew these actors most from. If there's a specific role you latched onto of theirs when you were thinking about them for, we can start with Martha, maybe. Yeah, you know Martha. So you, I wrote the parts. I wrote Reed Richard for Reed Bernie, I, and we will talk about Martha. But just so that you know, I had I had a character, sort of actors, character actors from New York theater in mind. You know, it was not that we were ever going to get Tom Hanks, but, you know, I would use him as an example, like Tom Hanks cannot walk into this room, you know, because it's the movie's over. It's Tom Hanks. And uh, and we, we just have to feel like we're watching real people that we've never met before. And we want the movie to be disarming in that way, that this feels like a real life. Right. And um, but I, I saw Martha's name on a list. You know, once we got our casting directors, Henry Bergstein, um, Allison Estrin and uh, we, I never looked back. I just, as soon as I saw her name and I think I, you know, I grew up watching Martha and I thought of running on empty where there's a scene with her and river Phoenix where there's so, so much emotion underneath, you know, she's kind of holding it all in and Martha, you know, I grew up, she was, you know, she's obviously in the Goonies and these movies, part of my childhood and parenthood. And I always remember thinking like that person, you know, that person's like an actor. There's so much going on. There's so much complexity and emotion. And that's a, that, that's a real actor. And, um, you know, I, I, but specifically running on empty because I wanted Gail has got so much contained and, and pain and rage and so much feeling that she's trying to transform, you know, and wants to do something with, wants to do, turn it into something better. And, and, but it, but it's not immediately tears or it's an, it's a poker face too, you know? And so I, I saw, I, I just got that image in my head of, you know, God, I think she was a teenager, but um, anyway, Martha, it was done <laughs> and we got along and she even said, oh, this was wonderful. She, you know, when we first FaceTime, just pre pandemic. So it was just, but it was like a FaceTime. We are, you know, she said, we have to have a rehearsal. And I did this movie with Sydney Lament. And we had a rehearsal and it changed everything. When we were on the day, we were so prepared because of that rehearsal. That movie was running on empty. And so I, it was some a mu- music to my ears to hear that and to think, okay, you know, and also to even, you know, think we're going to be like Sidney Lumet, you know? <laughs> so it was just, it was very cool. And I also agreed, you know, I wanted a rehearsal. We only ended up with two and a half days, but, you know, we did the best we could. Um, so that was Martha I and mean, Reed, like I said, I wrote it for, he's he's literally he's truly one of our best living stage actors and i was always keep i wanted theater actors because i knew so much of this we're gonna we're gonna 15 20 minute takes i'm not gonna be in the room we're gonna treat it like a love scene only the people that absolutely have to be in the room will be in the room we're gonna just close the door and let them play you two cameras kind of circling them throughout the day so so it was sort of like live theater live performance and so reed was right there at the you know from the very beginning um, it's funny, Jason, you know, and I heard his name, I thought, well, no, I you can't have, again, it's a Tom Hanks thing. You can't have Lucius Malfoy walk into this room, you know? Um, and, and, and I knew him as such villains, Event Horizon and the Patriot, but I sat down with him because it's like, who are you, who are you kidding? Jason Isaacs was interested in the movie, you know, you gotta see, <laughs> see this through. And he was so, um, intense. He had so many questions picked apart so many things in the script. We met over coffee and um, I was terrified. I was like so intimidated by him. I thought, okay, I can't, well, I can't do that. Like I can't, I can't work with that guy. And then it sort of took some time to realize, you know, that's the job. Like that's, you want to do this for a living. You want to do this. You want to make this movie better. 
you need to work with someone like that. You need to work with someone that's going to push you and not let you relax and not <laughs> let you get away with anything that isn't totally truthful and isn't going to make sense to these actors. You can't just push some line on a quality actor, right? And think that, you know, just have, please just say it. Like, it doesn't matter if you get it, you know? This movie demanded more than that, I felt. So, so it, Jason was just in, so impressive. Um, and his kind of intelligence and how much he sort of demanded of me and the material. Um, Anne was the last person cast. Um, and Linda, the part, I could never, uh, I never could see an actor. For some reason, the part of Linda, I, 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 I couldn't. And I, I don't know what that's about necessarily. I think it's the kind of complexity of the role, the, 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 the kind of the quality of grief and the sort of the challenges she's facing and sort of sort of reclaiming her identity as a mother and that, that, that she loves her son. She cannot stop loving her son, but she has to reconcile that with his actions. And so she feels that she's sort of lost her identity in this sense that she can't be a mother um, without loving her son, but how is she supposed to love this person? And um, it's just, it was, it's obviously an incredibly complex and challenging role. And I just kind of had this vague image in my head and it wasn't a person. And I saw Anne's name and I was, cause I'm a the big horror, horror film fan and hereditary and the, the leftovers and obviously what well, I handmade, you know, and I thought, well, no, is, is that obvious? You know, is that, you know, we have this, <laughs> she's all, you know, she's always playing these creepy ladies. Um, <laughs> And, and then, you know, I got a chance to talk to her and um, she's, she's like the sweetest, most empathetic woman, you know, you sort of ever met, you know, and, and it's so, dis and you can never look back, you know, you meet Anne for who she is and you're like, what the hell are all those crazy people, you know, you, <laughs> she's so far, the, so the opposite and, and she's, um, she wears her kind of everything on her sleeve, you know, right? She, she, she shares everything. She's so open. She's so giving with her vulnerability and uh, it's disarming. And, and I felt, you know, again, it was that sort of situation of never being able to kind of look back. And, you know, we had a rehearsal process where in my mind, I thought, you know, the best thing I can do, we have only two and a half days. The best thing I can do is, is just be vulnerable and share share my stories and everything I can to kind of create an atmosphere of vulnerability and trust. But I also was, you know, a first time director and only knew read and was nervous and didn't know how to do that. And luckily Anne did that anyway, she did that first, you know, that within 10 minutes of this rehearsal, within 10 minutes of meeting each other, she started sharing something about her life that, that, that kind of was connected to the story we were telling. And it, and it broke the ice, you know, and, it, and, and she started it and she was, she's that kind of woman. And, you know, you, you, you wanted that because this is a woman that has nothing to hide or can't hide anything. There's no defenses up. And I think she even says that, that, you know, the, the she goes into this meeting so willing and open to give everything of herself for, for, for these people, you know, because she, she, she doesn't feel she, the right to any sort of defenses or, or being guarded about anything given what happened. And, th and that's kind of, that's kind of an element, that's kind of a characteristic of Anne, you know, that she, she, she'll just, she, she, you can talk to her about anything and she will talk to you about anything. And it's a sort of a beautiful quality. Yeah, anyway, it's nice, nice to hear. Yeah, sorry, too, way too long of an answer. For no, no, it's, it's great. I also, I mean, I, I've watched from The Leftovers and Handmaid's Tale, but I also think about Compliance, which is the first, you know, yeah. big film of hers, which yeah. is it's a, such a different performance because she doesn't have any of that gentleness or vulnerability and, you know, more of that subservience to what everyone else tells her she should think. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and there's, there's, um, there's, there's that quality. There's something there. There's something to that. And that, the, you know, Linda... She, that idea of trying to reclaim some kind of identity and 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 find any sort of s sense of worth, you know, esteem, self-esteem, you know what I mean? It's sort of peace, being like, I, I have a right to continue to have a life and be able to love people and be able to offer something, you know, and that 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 that's part of her journey is feeling sort of worthy of even being there and potentially having advice or having something to say and I think it's one of the reasons you know there's a kind of a key scene at the end of the film 
um, or towards the end of the, I don't want to give anything away, but you know, she, she has, she has something else to say because it's sort of this journey of hers to sort of feel like, what can she say? What is she capable of saying? What, do, what do people want to hear from her? It's all such a sort of, um, that, that's kind of idea again, of sort of reclaiming the self and finding kind of finding yourself capable of things again, you know? Yeah. And it's such an extraordinary ensemble. And I know that for the film's awards campaign, all four of those actors have been considered supporting. Yeah. I don't know if that's something you're involved in or have any opinions about. I'm just curious. Do you think that makes sense if the, if you had to pick? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want to get in trouble here. I uh, <laughs> Look, I mean, you know, the, the, the screen time is basically the same, right? Um, it's so hard to think of them uh, they're they're either co-leads or co-supporting or all support it's very hard to give status i did sort of write it with you know jason jason and martha or gail and jay are are kind of you know they show up first and they, they leave you know i don't want to give things away but you know they have a little bit more um so they, they kind of struck me as leads uh, gail martha was the sort of spiritual lead for the movie you know, I didn't want, I wasn't thinking about protagonists or anti, antagonists, excuse me. I tried very hard. I didn't treat anyone like that, you know, I, 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 and I didn't believe that to be the situation in my own research. I never found the parents, at least I, in my, in what I read, I never found parents to sort of be monsters, right, of the, the shooter. And so it was clear to me, like, these are, I'm going to write these people with dignity, I'm going to play them. I'm going to put myself in their shoes and I'm going to sort of plead their case. Um, but for Martha, for Gail, um, that was kind of, if, the, if there's any conspicuous sort of, you know, journey through this, right? And, and the kind of, you know, traditional protagonist way, uh, it, 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 it was, it's her, you know, she's looking for something and, um, and she comes out of the movie, maybe the most conspicuously changed by it. Um, so, so she always felt to me like a kind of spiritual lead. I mean, look, you know, it's pain, it's hard for, I, I, I don't really see definitively better performances this year. You know, I think um, it's tricky because they are such an ensemble, it's hard to separate. You know, so the, for them to compete with one another, it gets, it's just difficult, right? It, it's what it is, but it doesn't, ultimately it doesn't matter because I, I have, I, I'm sure uh, being an actor myself and having the privilege of watching these people do this, the, people are gonna, uh, people are gonna look at these performances for a long time, it, it, regardless of whether or not they win awards. Of course, I think they should. I think they should all be nominated for Oscars um, uh, and they should have been nominated for the SAG Ensemble. But, you know, it, 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 this is the kind of thing people are gonna go look at, you know, for inspiration, for, you know, forever. For as long as we're watching movies, I just know it. I just know it. Cause that's what I do. I go back and watch great performances because I love acting and uh, I, I, it, 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 that's what this is, you know. And I did want to ask you one question because I, I remember seeing you years ago on Dollhouse as Topher yeah. and that was such an entertaining role. I don't think there's, I don't think that's a show that's coming back in some revival or some form or anything, but if it did, is that something you would return to? Oh my God, yeah, at 100%. I mean, I, I, that show was very um, ahead of its time. I was, uh, look, I loved Westworld. Uh, I can't, well, I, I, I haven't watched the later seasons, so I'll be honest, but I, I, I love Westworld. Like, how could you not like Westworld? Um, but I was so like, uh, you know, sort of bitter being like, we, we were doing that. We were doing that like 10 years ago. And um, it was, I think it was ahead of its time. I think it should have, you know, if it was out now, it'd be on a streamer or cable you know, there wouldn't be necessarily sort of oversight in the same way and the, the creative, you know, the creative minds behind it and Joss and the writers, you know, they would have just, I think they would have had a free reign, which is sort of difficult when you, you know, in network television. And, and uh, so, so, you know, I think, but when that show was on, it was on. I mean, when that show was at its, a good Dollhouse episode is, is like really, really as good as it gets. And uh, so, yeah, 100%, I would love to go back into that world. World. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so grateful for the work that I did with him because, you know, like Cabin in the Woods is like the greatest movie ever made. And, you know, so <laughs> there's some good stuff. I would gladly go back into those worlds. Yeah. Is your future more in acting or in writing and directing? 
I have, uh, I did a, uh, it's gonna be, it's really great. I've seen some of it. It's really, really good. Um, and I hate watching myself at this point, but I, I'm on the show, Julia, for it's HBO Max. It's about Julia Child. Sarah Lancashire plays Julia Child. David Hyde Pierce plays Paul Child. It's gonna be out this spring uh, in a, just a few months. I, I don't know that really, I think it's end of March, early April. I've seen four episodes. It's so addictive. I did not want to stop watching it. Um, it's 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 really really great. It's really really sweet and fun. And and Sarah Lancashire is just amazing. So I have that. So I I am an actor. I want to be an actor. I um. But yeah, no. I want to make another movie. At the very least, I I feel like I have to. I feel like I have to make another movie. Um, just to apply what I've learned on this one to another one. But you know, I I want to make sure that. Uh, you know, no one will call it like a play or something. You know, I want to make sure <laughs> I want to make sure I do something purely cinematic. You know, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to that. It's been really great to hear the passion you have for every part of this film and to get to to revisit it again. Thanks, man. No, I appreciate it. I, like I said, it means a lot. I, the film means so much to me. So thank you for doing this and taking the time. Thank of you. course. Good luck with this timeless film and looking forward to seeing what you do next. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you.